Yes! Van Helsing is a fellow philosophy graduate. Yes, yes, yes! Yes! Britain. An ancient kingdom with legends of violence, cruelty, and torment in its blood. Join your hosts, Ross, John, and James, as they bravely tread where few would dare. Witness their journey into the horrific history of British horror. They are... The General Witchfinders. Right, ladies and gentlemen, goblins and ghouls, and welcome back somehow to now the 40th episode. 4-0, you heard that right. 40th episode of the General Witchfinders podcast. I'm James in Bournemouth in southern England. I'm John Pountney. I'm locked in this room by Ross Cleaver. <laughs> uh, I was locked here three years ago. I can't get out. Can someone please come and release me? Um, it's in, in the South, South Wales. Of Wales. <laughs> <laughs> I can't. You're just going to have to try and find me because I can't give you any more um, precise details than that, unfortunately. I'm Ross in Dorchester in southern England, and this time we married the Brides of Dracula. <laughs> what? That doesn't make sense, Chris. Uh, well, okay, this time... Well, uh, mm, <laughs> it's fine. Time, yeah, go with it. Go with it. Listen to the beat of your heart, Marianne. You hear the beat of fear within you? Fear that will rise to a shattering crescendo of terror. You have strayed into a world of evil, where frightened people are held in the grip of unearthly horror. Beware of pity for the handsome prisoner in the Castle Meister. Beware of love, for in your heart is only the pulsating throb of terror. Starring Peter Cushing, as the doctor locked in mortal combat with overwhelming evil. Also starring Frida Jackson as Greta, who served the vampires with insane loyalty. <laughs> you needn't be afraid, she's dead. Martita Hunt, the Baroness, victim of her own son. Beautiful Yvonne Molore, France's latest sex kitten, as Marianne whose beauty was her passport to the twilight world of the undead. <laughs> David Peel as the Baron, blindingly handsome, yet his kiss transformed the most beautiful girls into monsters. So, Dracula the Damned is a 1960 British supernatural horror film produced by Hammer Film Productions, starring Big Chris Lee at... No, no, hold on a minute. Scratch that. <laughs> I was going to say, rather, rather, the original sequel to the first Hammer Dracula oh. film, which that should have been, was cancelled without explanation. Although Christopher Lee's decision not to return due to fear of typecasting <laughs> probably led to the Brides of Dracula tonight's or today's film taking place. Um, and Big Chris Lee did, in fact, return five years later when he starred in Dracula, Prince of Darkness. An so, inferior film, I think. So the, the Brides of Dracula is a 1960 British supernatural horror film produced by Hammer Film Productions, directed by Terence Fisher. The film stars, of course, Peter Cushing, David Peel, who wore lifts in his shoes, apparently, to make him the same <laughs> height as actor Peter Cushing. Uh, Peel, according to his bio at the time, was five foot ten. Cushing was apparently six foot tall. Wow. To make his vampire look distinguishable from Christopher Lee's, Peel wore a full blonde hairpiece. And more about that, yeah. that, that bouffant later. 
Yvonne Monolaw, uh, Andre Melly, Miles Mallison, the hearse driver in the Ealing Chiller Compendium, Dead of Night, see previous episodes, uh, Marticia, uh, Marticia Hunt, uh, known for her rich cluster of queens, dowagers, shrews, and evildoers. But it was her brilliant performance as the mad reclusive Miss Havisham yeah. in the classic Dickens, exp- Dickens uh, adaptation, Great Expectations, that earned her international recognition. And the David Jackson, Lean one. Hmm. Yeah. The only good version. <laughs> and Frida Jackson, who was also an alumna of Great Expectations. Amazing in this and um, uh, underutilized. Mm. And I'm going to really expound. Expound? Is that a word? I've, yeah. I, yeah. Expound Easy upon now. this later on um, because she's, I, I, she's by far the best thing in this. In fact, Marticia Hunt and her... They should be in spin-offs. I think that mm-hmm. they should yeah. they should be brought back from the dead and Big Finish should do a season <laughs> with them. <laughs> uh, Imagine how successful Big Finish would be if we, it was in our control. You know? <laughs> oh. <laughs> and, well, we could use AI to bring them back from the dead yeah. and just have a laughing all the way through. <laughs> through. That mad laugh. Yeah. <laughs> Very good job. Oh, I heard myself uh, then. That was weird. <laughs> <laughs> Commitment to, to the part. <laughs> so, um, meanwhile, uh, although the character of Count Dracula does not appear in the film and is instead mentioned only twice. So after the success of Dracula, Hammer commissioned Jimmy Sangster about more of a, about more who in a moment to write a sequel titled Disciple of Dracula about an acolyte of the vampire, with Count Dracula himself only making a cameo appearance. Sang's mm. script was rewritten by Peter Bryan to remove references to Dracula, whilst adding the character of Van Helsing. The screenplay was then further revised by Edward Percy. Uh, filming began on January the 16th, 1960 at Bray Studios, and the film premiered at the Odeon Marble Arch on July the 6th. It was distributed theatrically on a double bill with The Leech Woman. <laughs> <laughs> I can't say I've heard of the leech woman. Me neither. I think it's I got said. something to do with like like sort of Afri- yeah, or well, like African sort of magic and stuff like that. From like, like oh, the quick look at it. Brilliant. Okay, so it says the ending was originally planned to have the vampires destroyed by a swarm of bats, but this <laughs> proved too expensive to stage and shoot. Yes, and was also vetoed by Peter Cushing, who did not think his character would perform the black magic required oh. to summon the bats. However, the idea was recycled three years later for the climax of Hammer's The Kiss of the Vampire. The prop department put a lot of effort into making a realistic model bat, but it was lost. Ross doesn't provide us with any more details on that and had to be replaced on short notice. (gasps) This explains the unconvincing, which is being kind to it, model bat in the movie. Oh, like the Jumping Jack's Beaver. What? (laughs) (laughs) What's that? We had a beaver. We had a stuffed beaver in Jumping Jacks, uh, and it went missing, and that was stolen. Oh, and you, did you have to like walk one up? We, we didn't. Re- <laughs> we didn't recreate it, but um, oh, that just made me think. The Jumping Jacks beaver. I wonder where he is now. I thought the bat in this was quite good, Consi- compared to the bat in Scars of Dracula. Which oh, that is, was bad. Which is horrendous. That was bad. super bad. Yeah. Mm, okay. Interesting. All right. So then finally, it says the front door of Oakley Court served as the main entrance to Meinster Castle. Mm. Oakley Court has been featured in a number of classic horror films, including The Curse of Frankenstein, The Horror of Dracula, The Evil of Frankenstein, Die, Monster, Die, great title, <laughs> and The Rocky Horror Picture Show. Uh, so there you have it. There, that's that's the introduction. Yeah, it's quite short because it wasn't like a good. huge amount to all that, even, even though I'm, I did watch the making of documentary, which was, which was quite good on the uh, Oh, DVDs. really? Yeah. Um, there's a there's a couple of kind of like awkward anecdotes in there which you feel like oh, it was a it was a different time when they when they made this. Oh, okay, yeah. maybe don't repeat those. No, then, please. I, I might, I'll tell you now, but I cut it out. Do, uh, put herself into yogic trances. She was like stuck in a trance in there in a in a knickers and nothing else. Oh God. Oh Jesus. Oh God. Oh Jesus. It was it was just like two fried eggs nailed to a wall. <laughs> Yikes. Really, the, the casting of both these two actresses was a bit of a um coup, coup for yeah. Hammer at this mm. point. And I think they make the first half of the film very, very successful. 
uh, for me, it tails off very badly towards the end yeah. when it becomes much more hammer, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, well, so we start it off mm. then. So it, yeah. we start off with a, a universal um, distribution. Yeah. Um, thing, yeah. Which, which is quite, I thought was quite unusual. I was trying to look and see how many um, hammer films were distributed by universal, but um, is it just a case we don't normally see that on the versions we're watching? The deal came in at some point after Dracula and the success of Dracula or the horror of Dracula in America, mm. but it meant that they had a big injection of cash. And I think, well, not necessarily a big injection of cash. Some cash. R- relative cash. Um, and I think that's why this one particularly, and a, and a few after this, look a bit more lavish. Mm. And um, when you compare this to Curse of Frankenstein and Dracula, this is... This, looks a lot more lavish and it's almost on the kind of Wes Anderson scale of set dressing. Yeah. Kind of, I thought it looked yeah, yeah, yeah. really beautiful. Oh, like, it looks absolutely beautiful. Yeah. 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 Definitely. Well, they was talking about the, um, I think they called him lighting cameraman back then rather than a, than a, yeah, um, yeah, yeah, a yeah, cinematographer, yeah. but they were just saying that, um, he would have all these different colored, uh, lights to sort of like, put, yeah. it, like have little bits in the background. So I'm, you know, that you'd be like in the, um, I noticed when they was in the tavern, like there would be like little purple and red lights in the background. The sort of the window panes would have different color. Yes. Um, bits of glass in there. And it just looked really beautiful. But apparently he just took way too long light and everything. So they replaced him for uh, yes. later films. Yeah. they. T- it, he actually took care of what the films looked like. So mm. the early hammers look incredible. The later ones just look like dog shit sometimes. Mm. <laughs> Yeah, and we got an insane um, font at the beginning as well. Yeah, the font is probably the most overblown font of all time, isn't yeah. it? It's like, um, it looks like a lot of red carrots, words made out of red carrots in a, in a slightly horrific fashion, um, spelling out, does it spell, is it all of the typeface? Yeah, everything. Or it, is, all, all, yeah. all of the names were written in this. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it's almost illegible, but but quite dramatic. Yeah, over the um, top of a, a, an obvious model of the castle. <laughs> of course. But before we get into that, I often like to scan the credits at the start yes. to see if there's any notable names or things such as that. Because the one that really jumped out at me this time is Jimmy Sangster. Mm. And I thought, well, I know that, that name really, really rings a bell. And Jimmy Sangster, as one of the writers of the film, has a really kind of quite remarkable career, really, in the fact that he wrote a lot of horror and hammer horror stuff over in this country, but then just said, do you know what? Screw this as you absolutely should getting out of this cursed, this, this cursed <laughs> Island, quite frankly. Cursed shittle, yeah. Absolutely. And he went over to the States and then in the eighties, the stuff that, and, and late seventies that he did is incredible. He did, he did some, uh, he did three episodes of wonder woman. <laughs> uh, and, um, he also did um, episodes of Kolchak the Night Stalker. No way, did he? Yeah, really? yeah, yeah, yeah. Which was like a late night staple when we were kind of teenagers, weren't he? Yeah, it yeah, was, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. It was Chuck said oh, one episode. One episode in 1974. He wrote an episode of the Six Million Dollar Man. No way. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then reaching a pinnacle, some would say, in the 1980s, he wrote the teleplay to the toughest man in the world, the Mr. Oh. T. <laughs> wow. I think of Which that so often. climaxed, in case people have never seen it, dig it out if you need to, along with Mr. T's incredible album that he released at the time. And, <laughs> uh, and cartoon TV series. And, well, yeah, of course. But then, as I remember, in the toughest man in the world, his whole thing was he couldn't climb up a rope. Oh, he couldn't climb <laughs> up. A, he couldn't climb over a wall. There was a bit of part of it was a big assault course to prove he was the toughest man in the world. Well, like yes. the Krypton factor. Yeah, but yes, he couldn't John. climb over the wall. So at the end, it was neck and neck. But they knew that he was going to lose because he couldn't climb over the wall. And what yeah. did he do, James? He just runs straight through the wall <laughs> rather than climbing through it. He <laughs> crashes through it. Yes. Which yeah. is a, a very dramatic. Case. Again. So, nice. So thank it, you, Jimmy Sanks. An amazing that. career trajectory, a bit yeah. like um, Val Guest, where yes. you start and then you just don't know where you're going to end up. And that's the kind of career, tra- tra- it's so hard to say, trajectory, career trajectory yeah. that I'm really hoping for. Yeah, um, that'd be great. I really but... want to end up directing sex films in my 50s. <laughs> uh, if, if Britain carries on on the course where it's going, it's going to end up like a kind of quasi-Nigel Neal future yeah. state where yeah. um, people drive around in Land Rovers with mesh over the windows. Yeah, the sex and, Olympics. Uh, 
and I'm going to be directing sex films at that point. Yeah. And from, from a wheelchair. Oh, oh. <laughs> this this film has also given me some thoughts about a career, but I'll talk to you about them when we get to Apparently, um, <laughs> <laughs> apparently Peter Cushion was slagging off the script to um, Christopher and Lee at one point. And he, and, he, yeah. and he said, oh, I don't have many lines in this new film. And he was like, who wrote it? And he was like, he said, thanks to him. And he said, well, count yourself lucky. <laughs> source of a milk table three it's just oh yeah they do my head in yeah. so yes so so we, we get into it we get into our plot and yeah. we're told we get a voiceover oh a brilliant voiceover uh, what have i said dodgy voiceover for context i've said transylvania land of dark forests dread mountains and black unfathomed lakes Still the home of magic and devilry as the 19th century draws to its close. Count Dracula, monarch of all vampires, is dead. But his disciples live on to spread the cult and corrupt the world. Yes. Uh, and we're told that Dracula has been destroyed. However, you know, people that he turned into vampires are still roaming the land and mm. are still roaming free. Quite a nice idea, I thought. I yeah. quite like, quite he like was it, the quite monarch like of the vampires, apparently. Yes. Mm. Yes. Although, you know, the mad thing, the mad, mad thing about um, vampires is like all the various different lore, different writers, mm. uh, you know, come, come up with this this twaddle, quite frankly. Things that uh, are always was, added, don't they? Yeah. So sometimes you have people saying, oh, well, if you kill the one vampire, every person that he's turned into a vampire, they then all die and things like that. Uh. Oh, my God. There's all different things, isn't there? Yeah. Um, however, we're also told in the voiceover, it says um, Transylvania. So in other words, Romania fact fans. Mm -hmm. When they say land of huge lakes and dread mountains which i've yeah. got not pictured because this is <laughs> yeah. really, i've been to transylvania yeah. i've been to castle dracula it looks nothing like this yes <laughs> this is just a wood outside yeah. london somewhere isn't it is it? Yeah. i was watching this <laughs> again with Beck. i was watching this with beck and she's oh where do you think this was filmed instead of bray studios it would just be like just outside the Out house the yeah. <laughs> yeah every time every yeah. time uh, an incredibly muddy time of the year as well when when the but for me, that's what makes them so intensely comforting mm. is that you know exactly where you are. You know that there's a guy stood behind the camera, probably smoking a pipe in yeah. a cardigan, yeah. who's just driven there in an MGB and just like, oh, morning chaps, you know, oh God, here we, here we are again. And they dash one of these off in like four weeks or something, six weeks. Yeah. Uh, and then they just make another one. And that's why, you know, that's why I admire people like Jimmy Sangster, because he dashed off reams and reams and reams of these scripts um, just to entertain people. They they weren't, they weren't, um, they weren't trying to make high art. They were just no. trying to just make pot boilers for people to enjoy. Um, mm. The main thing I thought at the start of this film was that the music was very stodgy and it's not by the James Bernard who does the usual Dracula, Dracula music. So it's just got, um, you don't hear Count, what's he called in this? I can't even remember. Oh, uh, Count David Peel. Meister. Mon Count Mon Meister. You don't hear that, do you? There's no kind of uh, riff. There was um, a lovely bit of music every time um, uh, Van Housen gets out his uh, crucifix. I thought... Which I think is music from Dracula. Oh, okay. Which is the same music at the end of Dracula when he, I'm sure, when he gets the crucifix out and um, pushes Dracula into the sunlight at the end of Dracula. Yeah. I'm sure that's from the previous <laughs> film. Because they obviously thought, oh, we haven't got the crucifix music. We're just going to paste it in from the film we made five minutes ago. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. So we start with a mad... Uh, so... The first hour of this is a very, very good gothic fairy tale film, mm. isn't it? You start with a very good gothic carriage ride. Michael Ripper is the yes. um, um, coachman, uh, ubiquitous coachman in every <laughs> Hammer film ever. Um, he stops to there's a move log on the road, log, and then you see a man who looks a bit Christopher Leeish or a bit yes. Michael Gwynn in um, Revenge of Frankenstein, and then. 
that you see this guy a couple of times and then you never see him again. Yeah, it was kind of like so he <laughs> apparently he was a leftover from another version of the script which didn't have uh, Van Helsing in it. Uh, but it, it doesn't make any sense. So like so it's implied, I think, that this man has put the log in the road to stop the carriage so that he can get on the back of the carriage. Yes. And then go into town. But when they arrive at the town He just gets off. He gets off and he pays the um the the coachman some money. Yeah. So it's implied that they are in it together to get this woman to uh, to be delivered to the woman. But it's like, but I, I, why was he kind of like hiding? And, and yes, and it, 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 he doesn't. He doesn't need to hide. He could just get on the carriage normally mm-hmm. because the woman doesn't know him. We only see him as the audience, so none of that makes sense at all, does no. it? But I was and thinking then, whilst watching that, it is on my bucket list. I go have a. A, a, a carriage a, ride. A, yeah, a carriage ride in one of those carriages. Have you um, read The Haunted Carriage, I think it's called, by Amelia B. Edwards, Cleves? No, I haven't. Is it good? Uh, it's. I think it's my favourite short story of all time. Mm-hmm. I think it's The Haunted Carriage by Amelia B. Edwards. Um, and it's basically a guy who gets lost in the moors and he gets picked up by the, the post carriage mm. But then he realizes that everyone else in the post carriage is dead. Mm. Um, cool. It's it's a brilliant, brilliant Victorian horror story, oh, uh, and a, and it should be a Mark Gatiss um, Christmas special, cool. of which we can discuss later. It has been announced for this year, yeah, yeah. and it's and it's not M R James this no, year. No, so. Stay tuned to find out. What Stay tuned to find out if you haven't seen the BBC press release, which was about out about a month ago. Yeah. Um, but it's, I think this year flew under the radar a bit because there was a bit of a fuss last year when they said um, Count Magnus, but mm. this year I had to look for it. There's a lot of who going on at the moment, though, isn't there? There's a lot of who, <laughs> the who universe. Yeah. So our our heroine, if we can say, she's not really a heroine. She's kind of a protagonist and, and, until uh, she's quite meek, uh, isn't she? She is until Van Helsing turns up. She's kind of our 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 uh, kind of access point to the story. Yes. Um, anyway, she's called. We learn in a bit that she's called Marianne da- um, Danielle, not yeah. Suzanne Danielle, which is <laughs> a, a name from the eighties for the teenage. One of there. the best looking women of all time. Of all time. Yes, in right. the Hammer so, House of Horror TV series when she's in a basque. And, um, oh, Lord above her. I had to turn <laughs> hey, the TV out. off and go for a walk after that. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, yeah, so, so it's not Suzanne Danielle. It's uh, Marianne Danielle. <laughs> and we learn that she is on her way to basically what trans- turns out to be teacher training college. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. As far as I can make room. out. Yeah. Or, yeah, yeah, it's basically so, in someone's the house, isn't mm-hmm. it? Yes. So they kind of, in, kind of like the line is that she's going to go and study, although when she actually gets there, it seems to be that she's teaching already. It doesn't matter too much. Yeah. Anyway, so Michael Ripper drops her off in traditional Gothic, uh, Eastern European, semi-abandoned town and, and tells her to go into the local kind of hostelry, hostelry. which is yeah, called yeah, yeah. The Running Boar. Yes. It's, it's rare they give him a name, isn't it? I really, really in my life want to go to a place which looks like this and go in it and have goulash and, um, and whatever crunch. else. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's a very, for a Hammer film, It's I think it's on a sound stage. Again, it's a quite a lavish yeah, set. It's next to it. So uh, on the making, they had like a plan of what where they built all the different sets and everything. Oh, so, uh, okay. So they, they had the house which had like a sound stage built on the back and that had that yeah. was the main um, set with like the, uh, of the castle with the, the dining room and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then they had, had a bit on the side um, where they would have like the outdoor courtyard bit and there was like an old um uh like shed which they would always build the um all the taverns and stuff because it wasn't Uh, wasn't soundproof so they could only film stuff which was going to be loud in in there so that um it it would mask any noise from outside Uh, i see okay it's it's quite a good set though it's very atmospheric and the inside of the inn is very nice yeah. as well isn't it yeah, none of the Transylvanians speak with uh, any Romanian accent no and the, and the priest no. we meet later sounds Irish yeah <laughs> I, I wondered obviously I don't think they thought this through but and this is the second second episode in a, in a month in, in a row I've mentioned the hunt for, for Red October <laughs> that features one of the coolest things I've ever seen them do like at the start of the film they're all speaking Russian 
and then it, go- yeah. it kind of z- camera zooms into the character's mouth, and then mid sentence he flips oh, from Russian into that's English, a good idea. and then they're all speaking, thus giving mm. you the idea that they're all speaking Russian, you're hearing them speak English, and the various different Russian accents are then the transposed yeah. English accents. So, yeah, yeah, similar yeah. so to, that's, um, that's what I always go with. Chernobyl, yeah. That's what they did yes, Chernobyl, ex- right? yes, yes, very similar to that, Ross. Yes, good shout. Yeah. Which is brilliant. If you haven't watched Chernobyl, watch Chernobyl. Chernobyl. I watched the um, Fires of Pompeii today when they were saying that everyone is being translated by the uh, the TARDIS. Is, uh, uh, yes. Yeah, but if you speak um, if you speak Latin, it comes out as um, Welsh. <laughs> Fair enough. It, um, I think they, they invented that kind of idea in The Mask of Mandragora. Which is filmed in Wales, in Port Myrian. There we are. It's carry, carry on. It's all links. Right, so, and also, so when, uh, when Marianne walks into the bar, mm. it, it's that classic thing of, it all goes quiet, and everyone mm. turns and looks at her. And I wanted to ask you guys, has that ever happened to you? Yeah, the drag walks- the arms in, um, in uh, Bear Regis. Um, oh, yeah. And I, I had a sleeper t-shirt on the time, and the mm-hmm. guy came up to me and asked if I was gay. <laughs> to, to be to be fair, please. Um, they had a point. Um, I it's once went. I once went into the maddest pub ever in Merthyr, oh. and I was, <laughs> and it was like I'd gone through a time portal. I was looking for a Bruce Davidson um, photo setting, which is in a place called Kaipantawilt, which is wow. not easy to say. Oh. Um, and it's famously uh, like an Alice in Chains cover or someone like that, or oh. Bruce Springsteen or someone. This photo is quite famous. So anyway, I went into this pub and I went from um, 2018 into 1979 because this pub is basically like someone's lounge with a bar. And then on the bar was sat like a nine-year-old girl in a very 70s-looking school uniform who was basically serving... Time slip, John. It's a time slip. <laughs> time slip. It was really weird. And I was just like, hi, like, am I in Kai Pantawilt? And they were like, yeah, what do you want? And I was like, oh, I'm just looking. Was that the voice dinner. of the nine-year-old girl? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, there was a bloke in there as well. Yeah. And it was just fucking mental. And I walked out and was like, whoa, that was just so strange. Uh, and I've never been back, and I probably never will go back. You go back, and it would like, and it would be just a ruin. They said, no, that place burnt down in 1976. <laughs> yes. So that was very odd indeed. Uh, but most of Merth is like a time slip, to be honest. Um, yeah, there's no no surprise. I, my one was one of my uh, disastrous former relationships when I was uh, when I was around about sort of 28, 29. Uh, we went to visit her pe- uh, her mum oh, who lived amazing. on sort of like the sort of outskirts of London uh, anyway and lived uh, kind of like on the edge of an estate and she, and the girlfriend Wait, the says, estate, James. Oh, <laughs> sort of the oh sort of she said oh there, there's a pub nearby we'll, we'll go and get a drink and I said okay and it was one of those classic flat roof pubs mm. oh. on, on an estate and you know like straight away like oh my spider senses started tingling I thought this yeah. ain't right this isn't good yeah. I, even at that point I knew don't ever drink in a pub what, flat what roof. is it about those flat roof pubs yeah. just terrible. I went to a club just... like that in Swansea once where they <laughs> You um, we served the drinks for a slit in the wall, and it was like beer with the plastic on the top. And then on the dance floor, that wasn't prison. (laughs) And on the dance floor, there was big metal barrels for you to chuck your empties into the. Amazing, but anyway, so it's interesting to see that out of the uh, the various. Uh, various far-fetched things which we've seen on this podcast. The, that's the first thing we can all truly empathize. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So what happened so, there, James? What you, happened you in walk, the flat? What happened you in the walk, flat? Oh, it was just and... we just then had a really uncomfortable kind of drink for <sighs> about an hour, featuring various locals just looking over and staring at us. It wasn't <sighs> t- t- too bad because she had been there a couple of times before, yeah, and so had that kind of uh, you know, I'm not a total outsider, but you could tell they were not pleased mm. with me. So and weird, my isn't it? Clearly, liberal tendencies. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> There's, there's a pub like that in Ely, um, in Cardiff, where mm. you drive past now, and there used to be a dog on the roof and stuff, and like an Alsatian sat on the roof. <laughs> and for about the past 10 years, it's been a burned out shell now. Yeah. It's just, well, what is it about the flat roof pubs? There is some kind of folk horror Thing ley line thing happening there, with yeah. flat roof pubs, isn't there? Do you, mem- do you remember when I used to live on that flat near the train station in Weymouth? 
yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. Yeah, so we went to a pub. There was a pub on the corner we never went to. And one time, mm. we thought, oh, we go, we go there. We just go and, and we put um, our dinner in the oven. And I said, well, you think it'd be fine? He said, yeah, there's only like three doors down. So we put it in there and went to this pub. And it, well, it went absolutely silent. And there was a three-legged uh, greyhound, look really sad <laughs> little one, like limped, hopped over towards us. There was uh, a man with a, a parrot on his shoulder covered in like bird shit. <laughs> Wow! Uh, no music at all. You know, everyone's just sitting in there, like looking at you. And then we heard a, a fire engine going off, and I was convinced our flat was on fire. So I basically ordered a drink and then just ran away. <laughs> oh dear God! Whilst Becca was then kind of press ganged into finding Long John Silver's treasure yeah. by the sounds <laughs> arm wrestling contest. Yeah, well, I've had arm wrestling contest with sailors. In, um... Oh man! Okay, okay, yeah. okay. No, no, no. So I, I'm sorry, I started this. Sorry, dear listener. More one stars yeah, yeah, coming. Yeah. But anyway, right. So uh, Marianne sit, sits sits in the pub, and we're just told it's a bit of a a strange town what what, what would we say the, the vibe coming off it is is backwater. it like we don't get a lot of people like staying here land. transylvanian backwater so, yeah it's very slaughtered lamb but uh, 24 years before only 24 years before <laughs> and that's it insane. feels like it, that's insane. it's mad isn't it yeah. it isn't it mad we then have the arrival incredibly of um, uh, Baroness Meister. Mm. The everything goes very, very strange. As everyone this, runs off, yeah. Uh, well, you don't expect out. a woman, do you? Mm. You expect the man in the cape to come back, mm. and I think that's the point. That the big reveal is that it's the woman with the amazing face that comes in, mm. Mm. and you're like, oh, who's this then? So this is I've got this is the first example of, of many in this film where people order f- food or are given food, mm. yeah, don't eat or drink any of it, and then leave without paying. paying I know for that's it. what I thought. There's <laughs> a difference. Yes, uh, but yeah, uh, well, amazingly, she just walks in through the door and just goes wine, and they yeah. bring her wine. I thought, oh, I'd love to be able to do be, be in that position. It's wine. <laughs> just, just bring it to me. <laughs> if it, if it was me, I'd say fried chicken. Um, so yes, uh, the, the and, and this mysterious lady we are told is the Baroness Meister, who is um, so obviously kind of like the uh, uh, the rich, the, you know, the gentry of the town. Yes, um, everyone is very very suspicious of her. She kind of sidles up to Marianne and sort of establishes that she's just passing through. Um, we then also find out that the coachman Michael Ripper's legged it. Yes, mm-hmm. kind of leaving her abandoned for the night, and she's like, "Oh, it's okay. I'll stay here in this Weatherspoons." <laughs> what it is, you know, it is for all intents and purposes. The Baroness says, "Look, you, you shouldn't have to stay with these peasants. Come and stay with me up in the castle." Which yeah. I've just put. She's that's like getting an Airbnb upgrade, isn't it? <laughs> she's like, "Don't come and stay in this pub, this drafty old pub. Come yeah. and stay in my my posh." Uh, castle to which Marianne absolutely accepts and says fantastic let's go off to the castle they go together so at what point so what happens to her baggage because the baggage is not left by the carriage which is taken away but Mm. later on she has a change of clothing and then then another point she turns up with some baggage so what's happening with the baggage I've no idea and then they talk about baggage which she's left behind yes yes yeah no that's a good point Cleves I hadn't um but, but, I hadn't thought of that. But a second carriage, and I thought, well, a bit of money here. They're not just reusing the same carriage. No. Is, they've had all redressed it, so... American yeah. money cleaves. Yeah. See, that's yeah. what it is. Yeah. We're introduced then to Greta, mm. who is basically the Mrs. Danvers uh, character in this, yes. uh, as in Rebecca. Frida Jackson. Who is the mean stepmother in uh, Great Expectations, I think, isn't she? Whoa. These are both serious, proper actresses. Mm-hmm. And as soon as they click in... You're like, this is, for a hammer, this is like, this is really good. Um, and, and I think these scenes are just great because it's all like setting the scene and mm. it's this kind of inexorable, at this point, you think that the old lady, the, the mother, is the villain of the piece, yes. don't you? Yes. There's no yeah, kind of, um, you, uh, I mean, that's what's difficult with watching these hammers is that, for all of my life now, thanks to reading the Dennis Gifford book or the other book um, about the Hammer films, I know exactly who the villain is. Whereas you try and go in fresh to it, obviously everything that presents here is that the 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 
the mad housekeeper and the mother of the villains and they're keeping the son captive in some way. Oh yeah, but so we don't know about the son yet. Well, you we... haven't met the son yet. No, no. Yeah. At this point you think he's dead, don't you? Well, they kind of t- they're talking about like she noticed that the, the, the dinner is set for two yes. and there's and then she goes out onto the balcony and she sees a guy um it's a nice a, set. Yeah, really it's nice been. set. And it's really obviously not done on two on two different floors. Nice. Yes. But but they have a really good great so looking down and it's got that mis- yeah 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 and it does feel you know like a, a very classic sort of gothic tale of that there's someone yeah. in the building yes. which everyone's denying exists and yeah, you yeah. Know, i think that if this was a modern film you could have sort of played out what well, is that a ghost you know yeah. or, or because there's a point where she sees and then looks away and he's not, no longer there and mm. uh, some yeah, mm-hmm. and again just looks beautiful the colors the, the mm. way it's lit and everything is it's fantastic Um, having settled in for the evening uh uh, marianne and the baroness sit down for dinner and she's like i always sit i always set a second plate at dinner in case i have any company i thought that's really wishful thinking isn't it really but (laughs) um and then she says to her look you may go anywhere in this house but not through that door yeah um and then she says, oh, you know, I, I saw somebody. And then does, first of all, does she deny that there's anybody there? Yes. Yeah, yes. She's so. like, no, hey, you, you didn't. She's like, no, but, you know, but I did. Um, she's like, if I was you, forget about it. Mm. Of course, naturally, she doesn't. And later on that night, in you know, quite a good, as we've just been saying, a really good shot, she goes out onto the balcony from her bedroom again, only to see this guy. And he's now stood right on the edge of his balcony. As if he's going like, to throw himself al- off. As if mm. he's about to throw himself off. And she's like, don't do it. Don't throw yourself off. He's like, oh, would that I, w- would that I could, my lady. And then he says, I'm her son. Yeah. Mm. And, I, you know, and, I, and he's locked, she's locked me up, yeah. And she, she's locked me in there. And she's like, oh my God, no, this is dreadful. And I have yeah. put down that she's won over very quickly. Yes. Very easy. <laughs> uh, very by, quickly. By a guy, and the reveal is that he's chained by his ankle, yes. which I think is a brilliant reveal at this point. Yeah. Again, is is massively gothic. And it's just like the guy that's chained into the into luxury, essentially, mm. isn't he? Which is mm. a, a, a brilliant idea. We were talking about that at, um while we was making dinner, just saying like, how it's nice. It was a silver. They don't go into like the uh, the vampiric law about the silver, but it's a silver yeah. chain mm. and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> Beck was wondering, yes. like, does it does that mean he, he never changes out of those clothes? And, mm. like, and because like you would have, they would have to take the chains off him. And, and also, how does he get if he is eating with his mother? What the second place, which is mm. oh no. I'm thinking that's why it wasn't it, but she knew that the woman was going to be delivered there, wasn't she? Because yes. she's, she's paid. That's that's why People- the second. Second place was set. Yes, I get. You it. find mm. out that people are delivered there all the time, don't you? That they that that's they go out of their way to kind of get people there. I think as a vampire, you basically just sleep in your clothes, don't mm. you? Yeah. You don't you don't sweat. You don't kind of dirty your clothes like a human being does. You mm. just kind of exist well, also, spiritually. Say, do they really sweat? Because well, no, exactly. Kind of yeah, yeah. They're, so, they're dead, aren't they? So it's just kind of... I seem to remember, like, they cry and sweat blood, don't they? Oh, oh do they? That? Yeah. But, you know, again... <laughs> Where'd you get that from? Please? Probably Anne Rice. Anne Rice. Yeah. <laughs> no, I thought you were going to say, like, a, a, well, I once got a card out of a Weetabix box, <laughs> which said that they cry and sweat blood. Miss Danielle, or, you know, who decides that she is going to go and release the young master... Mm. Uh, and and she does so she in a unlocks, bed, in a dressing gown and uh... in a dressing in a dressing gown and then it's kind of all hell is is let loose mm. yeah because does he just like then immediately scarper Would yeah but the, yeah. It, there was a, there's a nice little um scene of her having to go and get the key from yes the, oh that was it uh, that from, well that's it yeah. i remember now yeah so that's when you still think the mother is the villain don't you mm-hmm. yes she's she has the she's got an amazing costume on but she has the kind of creepy music at that point yeah, and there's a bit of like when she's you think she's going to be found, but she's actually hiding out outside the window and, and yeah, stuff. Yeah, 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 Again, yeah, yeah, yeah. Up up until this point, really, it's all really good. I'm I'm, I'm enjoying it. I've I've point. written at this point twenty five minutes in and still no cushing. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, the mother and son then are kind of reunited. Have I jumped a bit? When she finds out that she's let him go, she starts like shitting herself. The um, yes. the mother, and then the yeah, uh, and then the the maid. I want to say vampire, but I'm giving away the vampire. Oh, basically, careful, right? she, careful. So careful. the the um the young girl is running away from the the mother, and then yeah. the, the, 
the vampire chap. Is oh, he turns up in his cape. In his cape, he? yeah. <laughs> yes. And then essentially commands her to leave her alone. Yes. Yeah. And then he hypnotizes his mother, doesn't he? So that scene is great because he's like, mummy, kind of like like Prince Charles when he was talking about the Queen in like the um all the uh you know the jubilees and stuff yeah. um and i really like that kind of dynamic and it, unfortunately there's not enough of that dynamic is there between mother and son i think that could be really good if they yeah then essentially that. he allows the young girl to escape and then yes and then he's sort of like left in the house with his mum and then you find out of, later on what he does to to his mother at yeah. that point yeah but when you was talking about quickly convincing the young girl to help her escape yeah i mm. think I think that she he is hypnotizing her because it, they, they, you are seeing elements of mesmeriz- mesmerism. Mm. Like he, mm. he controls his mother at this point. There's points mm. later on where you know she will she finds out that, uh, that the um, the Baron has killed the mother, but still go goes on to agree to marry him and stuff like that. Mm. So he's he's obviously obviously yeah. either she's stupid or this guy has got some kind of mind control yes. over, over people. Yeah, 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 yeah. When do we find out now that Greta has gone absolutely loopy and is right, just laughing? Right now. And, yeah, because yes. yeah, it's, it's a weird kind of scream slash laugh. I put down it's the most disturbing bit of the film. She goes absolutely bonkers. She is, yeah, yeah, yeah. She is a bit like um, who is the house, uh, like the housemaid in Father Ted, <laughs> Mrs. Doyle. <laughs> Mrs. Doyle, thank you, Ross. Yeah. She's she's a bit like Mrs. Doyle on acid. Yeah, she's like she like facilitates, she oscillates between like, oh my god, what have you done, sir? <laughs> yeah. Yes. You know, she she's just, she's out there. She's it's wild. It's a brilliant performance. It's one of the best performances in a Hammer film. Really. Yeah. yeah. And then she and finds she... the dead body of the mother. At that yes. Point. And also the coffin. Yeah. We see, dun, and then dun, you have dun. the coffin reveal, which is brilliant. Mm, yes. And I love, so, I love oh all my that. God. So up to that point, if you didn't know, you wouldn't know he was a mother no. up until that no. point. Exactly. No. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So, and so uh, the, the maid says, oh, he'll be back. He has to mm. come back here. You know, because oh, you know, they have to go back to their 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 coffins with the, with the, the earth, native their earth, homeland in and all, all the rest thing. of it. So that is kind of like dun 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 end of Act One, and yeah. then after that, Peter Cushing arrives to classy this production yes. even further. Thirty one minutes in, Cushing mm. arrives. So he essentially finds Marianne um, collapsed in the woods because she's been running all night to try and get away from um, the castle. Bad fuck up. <laughs> <laughs> There's no Ross, other word we... for it, really, is there? You've been invited back to someone's house. You find out that the mo- <laughs> the mother is now dead. The maid has gone insane, and the guy that you thought you were saving is actually a vampire. That's qu- that's a bad night oh, out. It's, isn't it's it? all gone wrong. Isn't it? yeah, I know it's happened wrong. to you a few times, Cleves. <laughs> <laughs> a few times in Jago's. It's gone worse than that, John. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> right, where were we? They're, they're in the in the um in the carriage, and part of the conversation, Peter is like, uh, "Oh yes, have you ever heard of the cult of the undead?" Yeah, it's, like, it's, it's out of the frying pan into the fire for yes. this poor young girl. I think the bit that um that's really good is the wake, and that's very atmospheric, yes. and that's got a good bit of. You see all the garlic and stuff, and it's it's the coffin has got a nice kind of um, Eastern European blanket in it, and mm-hmm. you just think, yeah. God, they really took care in these films because some of the later films, particularly um, Dracula has risen from the grave, just feels so rushed and mm-hmm. kind of like stuck together with blue tack. Whereas these films actually look like they're they're existing in a in a filmic universe of, yeah. of of quite a specific kind. Yeah. Uh you know, like I mentioned earlier, Wes Anderson universe. 
at this point they looked a bit like a hammer universe i mean later on they just they didn't give a shit as long as there were naked women in them <laughs> but i think these ones do look really very which about wes anderson or hammer because there was, <laughs> there was a quite a, a lot of gratuitous um nudity in uh, some of the recent wes anderson stuff as well was like, is there yeah but, which film uh the the french one it's like it's the going, French one. The one where it's in, we're about in the newspaper in France, and Scarlett Johansson is like naked for like half an hour in it. You know, like, I, don't, I, I, I haven't, I haven't seen that one. Yeah. But I, uh, if you can send me a link, please. <laughs> it's on Disney Plus. <laughs> it's Disney. Yeah, yeah. Oh. All, all the Wes Anderson stuff's on Disney, isn't it? The world's gone right. mad, doesn't it? I I noted that I because I looked at, at Peter Cushing and I thought you know because Cushing always looked a certain age and I thought that thing of yeah. people back in the fifties though aging rapidly and I thought he's probably yeah, about yeah. thirty two in this film yeah. isn't he <laughs> and I also noted that close up when they showed him he reminded me he looks quite a lot lot like Tom Hiddleston in this oh, yes. yeah 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 and, yeah, yeah. I, thought, yeah. Back here, yeah. and yeah. I wondered if there was some sort of thespian dna in this country mm. that we all, yeah because pe- people often say that like you know like hiddleston's a bit like richard e grant yes mm. and i was like there's almost like a line between you know like a line from the, the three of them yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. different eras of angular thespian men mm. one of the things we're often asked is like what because we are now at the start of a new era of, of hammer it's been bought oh, by yeah, someone yeah. are you when you say we, are you talking about us three here? Or? Uh, uh, the podcast. Um, uh, right. On our Twitter, General Which One. Uh, oh, I see, a topic yes. which comes up often is, um, I think they want us to talk about, is the, the new era of, of Hammer. What oh, would we would do? Because I know the, um, because we've got the Eddie Izzard, Jekyll and Hyde film Hyde coming thing, out soon. Yeah. Which I'm, what? I'm not sure. Yeah. What are people saying about that, Cleves? Uh not a lot, really. I've so. seen one review saying it is absolutely abysmal. And I've seen one review going, Eddie Izzard is always <laughs> worth watching, but everything else in this film is bad. Yeah. It, well, the well, basically, he changes by having a, a, a like a green spliff, or they turn into... <laughs> yes, Cleves, don't put any of this in or we're going to get cancelled. <laughs> <laughs> but, like- but one of the things they keep saying, if, if they were going to bring back Dracula... Um, in the universe, who would we who would we cast as Dracula and Van Helsing? So I think a lot of people are saying Ray Fiennes as Van Helsing, but I think he's too old, personally. Yeah, he's uh, too old. Yes. Now. But but Tom Hiddleston could do it. I think Hiddleston th- would I th- rock it. Yeah, I think that if I was going to do it, you would just want unknown actors, mm. and you wouldn't nice. want yeah. because I just think it's really difficult now to be like, oh, we'd have so and so, and we'd have so and so because. Uh, they come with so much baggage, baggage, yeah. mm. and they're always just... much older than you think, aren't they? Like you go, oh, yes. yeah, he could do. It. He's fifty six. You know? yeah, 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 yeah. Whereas you know, Cushing was quite famous at the point they did Dracula yes. as a TV actor. Mm. No one knew who Christopher Lee was. That was the point. Everyone was like, "Who's this really handsome young guy?" Mm. Um, whereas you know, if you if you cast, and that's a bit like you know when Matt Smith was Doctor Who. Mm. He'd only Unknown. like yeah. he'd only really been in one thing before that, yeah. which me and Hell watched by chance with um, Party Animals, wasn't it? Well, no, it was the Ruby and the Smoke we had yeah. seen yeah. with um, Billy Piper, Billy Piper, which yeah. was really good. Um, that was the main kind of thing that he was known for. Um, so I think, yeah, if I was going to redo Hammer stuff now, it would be some really good up and coming theatre actors rather than. Uh, you know, a person who was a big name because I love the guy who, who played Dracula in the Stephen Moffat stuff. I think he was brilliant. Yeah, yeah he was. Bang. Yeah, 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 he was really who's good. Also, who's also very good in the Northman. Yeah, as well. he's amazing. Mm-hmm. 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 Yeah, I, I, I thought that was a very good performance. Yeah, I, I felt like the third part of that. Just went, it went off the rails. But I didn't it, like any of it. Oh, the first, I like the first one a lot. <laughs> oh, what Dracula? Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I I didn't like any of it. I thought it was silly. Yeah, but I thought he was excellent as Dracula. I I mm. think I'm just sick. I just want to see a Dracula where they just do the fucking book story because mm. every mm. single one is like this is Dracula, and then you watch it and you're like, it's not the it's not the fucking story. Mm-hmm. It's like it's totally different. He's an old guy with a mustache. <laughs> <laughs> who looks like Harry um, Palms. yeah who lo- yeah exactly who looks quite animalistic mm. and then you've got Gary Oldman or you've got fucking god knows who mm. um yeah so that's that's what i do is that kind of and i'd film it in whitby 
Yeah. Because they never go to Whitby and they never use the really amazing atmosphere of Whitby, yeah. which is incredible. I think the only one that really uses Whitby is the um, BBC 1970, yeah. 1977 one, which Cleves. Yeah, we, it will be doing this year. Won't yeah, we? yeah, this coming year, yeah. 2024. 2020. It's a big year, listeners. Yeah, we've got the whole, whole year um, mapped out. Uh, yeah, what, yeah. Already one change might have been happening, but we'll see. Why? Uh, because someone suggested something would look really good. So, so just one last one last thing about the Dracula. Um, if we were going to do a new Dracula, would you set it in in uh, now, or would you set it back when it was meant to be? I would do ex- what the book is. Yeah, I'd set it in eighteen nineties Whitby, Transylvania, and London, Carfax Abbey. I'd have Dr. Saywood, I'd have the whole thing, and I wouldn't piss about with it. Because it doesn't need messing about with. You just make it verbatim to the book. Uh, it's like Shakespeare. You don't take Shakespeare and then say, oh, I'm going to fucking... That's half about just, it. Yeah. yeah, change the whole story. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's just nonsensical. Okay. Well, and I've never, I've never seen a version which is... I've never seen the version which Christopher Lee always used to talk about, where he had the moustache which I think was a Spanish film in the 70s. <laughs> of course um, he had a moustache. <laughs> never, I've never seen that version, and I'd love to see that. Senor Big Chris. <laughs> it's, it's Dracula in a spaghetti western. <laughs> western. <laughs> wow, wow, wow. Dracula. Right. Let's, let's get back to this. This is where the film starts to go downhill, isn't Brand it? Helsing really? sits down with Marianne, and yeah. there's an amazing bit where he's like, okay, what I want you to do is I want you to write down everything that happened to you, no matter how trivial. And I've put, I've put in <laughs> and brackets. And forget it. Yes. <laughs> and I put, write down everything that happened to you, no matter how trivial, and perhaps what underwear you were wearing at the time. <laughs> I was like, and if you want to do pervy. a drawing. <laughs> you know, that, that would and then, as John says, his then advice is, and then forget it. <laughs> and then they t- then, then they turn up at the uh, the mainstay of a lot of films in the seventies, a, a a girls' school. For some reason, yes. men of a certain age who are making films in in the in the sixties and seventies thought, yeah, what we need to they, see on screen is a girls', is a school. girls school. Yeah. So yes, this is when we learn. This is where Marianne was supposed to be going in the first place. Yes. Van Helsing drops her off. And then to start off with, the headmaster is having none of it and says, I'm not having, a, you know, these ladies being accompanied by anyone. Van Helsing gets out his business cards like an American psycho. Yeah, it's says, that part's fucking, amazing. Get your eyeballs around that sunshine. <laughs> yeah. Van Helsing. And the headmaster is quite rightfully, he's like, oh, Dr. Van Helsing. And now here's my big note for this. I've put, this has never been clarified. I don't think in anything, in any of the other Dracula based literature or media I've ever seen, where I have put, yes, Van Helsing is a fellow philosophy graduate. Oh, yes. Right. We're told he's got a philosophy PhD. Yeah, I was like, yes, 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 yes. <laughs> yes. And I was like, and so now, what i and here's my, what John was saying about what his late stage career might be. Cleaver, thought, that's the um, intro to the whole podcast. <laughs> yes, yes. Maybe. Yes. Maybe I could, because Ross is saying that he's going to put an ad for us in what magazine? Uh, Dark Side magazine. In Dark Side magazine. And maybe with an addendum now, James is available for necromancy slash vampire hunting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Look, I think I can help here. I've read the critique of pure reason. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> and you Honestly. can also get them to sort of meditate as well. And, and some yeah. of that. Yeah, 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 yeah because well. and yeah, because also Van Helsing's also done theology. Yeah. So I really love that. I was like, oh, wow, we finally got Van Helsing's academic background. And hey, yeah. uh, you know, there's a little bit of an overlap between I and he. So that was yes. very exciting. Um, and so, yeah, this is when uh, kind of Van Helsing then talks about, like, I think what you were mentioning earlier, Ross, like what the deal is with um, vampires. And then then this could, I think, could be our time to mention the amazing article, the blog post that John found us uh, about this film that said there's more going on in this film than you may realise. Mm. And who's the lady that wrote it, Cleves? Because I follow her on Twitter and I think we should give her credit for... Absolutely. Penelope Goodman. She's yes! A senior lecturer of Roman history and Gothic horror. And yeah, a yeah, 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 yeah. 
Brilliant. Yes. Well, bravo, Penelope. It, it's a really great article, and I enthuse all of our our listener to go to go and listen to this. <laughs> uh, go and listen to it. Or even go and read it because it's really good. She makes some fantastic points about how this movie is kind of queer coded mm-hmm. in a lot of ways, yes. and how the um, the the young Baron, who is our, now our vampire in this film, has a lot of kind of gay, uh, more more of a how should we say more of a homosexual feeling to him than big chris lee does yeah mm-hmm. yeah yeah who yeah, is very yeah, yeah. strongly heterosexual and it's men and women it's a very different vibe and that's tied into the fact that one of the rings he wears uh, and she points out the detail of the fact that the one of the, the ring he wears is of alexander the great who of course alexander the great was gay and things such as that and it's supposed to be like passed down which is again a nice touch and then in the article she also mentions how this is a film that mentions uh, vampirism as folklore which is the scene that we're talking about right now mm. when peter cushing says oh well you know um these people in this area they use folklore in order to survive and, and you know to structure their lives and that's that's very different to a lot of the the hammer things that we've watched and yeah sat through but so she also far. talks about how um the mother disapproves of his lifestyle and, yes. um, and, and, and the things he gets on. Gets She's on. ashamed of him. There's a yeah. kind of shaming part but, to it. Isn't but there? also wants to protect him as well. And, um, and there's a, you know, that, uh, because of his sort of dealings with these, um, people she doesn't like, mm. he's got, he's got himself into some kind of trouble. And, and, and now it's just like, well, I, now I need to protect, protect him, but, uh, and stop him from being, mm being mm. like the people he, he's met and, and have the life where he, he wants to have and stuff. And, 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 and sort of almost. Sort of, I like, think, I think I read relationship. the, I think I read the tweets in lockdown at some point and I thought it was a brilliant subtext for the mm. film, which I hadn't watched for a long time. Um, and I read the article and I just thought that it was a cre- really clever, really clever way of rereading a film, which mm. was made at the time when homosexuality was illegal and it's and homosexuality in that era was a lot to do with different motifs and symbols and, mm. and a lot of kind of secret mm. underground well, not organizations, but you know, in Soho and places like that, there was the people like Francis Bacon and a lot of people had it had a very kind of secret kind of mm. almost patois of what they were doing. And and I think that you know, a film like this can only benefit from that reading because it really, it really enriches the film. Yeah. Because otherwise, at, from this point on, this film becomes quite flat, doesn't it? Which is it a does. real shame. Yes. Uh, when it becomes the kind of vampire chase, who done it? Formulaic. Kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Where, whereas yeah. the first half is this mad fairy tale where, where once you've read this article, you get this great queer subtext, which is just like. The mother is ashamed. She keeps her son hidden. Um, he's got these kind of Byronic curls, which are to do with Alexander the Great and stuff. And you're like, whoa, this makes the film really fun. And then the second half is just a bit, which is really unusual for me because I love Peter Cushing. But as soon as he comes into the film, you're just a bit like, oh, it's just now it's just like Peter by Cushing. Numbers. Yeah, Chasing the, numbers, the Bad Guy. Yeah, yeah. And, and yeah. you have a few bits where... Yeah, the priest, which who is about to be um, introduced now, who's just yes. a pointless character, sounds Irish, and then later on you've got the comedic character of the doctor of the village, who is just kind of, I mean, he's fun, but support. it's no point of having a minute. It's no. Well, he, he comes too late into the film, doesn't he? Yeah. It's yeah. like, yeah. it's just yeah. really weird that they introduce his character within the third act of the film. It's but just the, very strange. But I think my, mm. my favourite scene comes up here. So essentially we saw the wake of a, a young because mm. after after the um the vampire has been set loose what one of the village um girls dies yes. and they're having a wake and then um he the boy the she's buried in the church and and they get in trouble for doing that because the um the priest is saying you, you know how she died she can't mm. be put into um consecrated ground hallowed ground yeah. yes yeah. and so then van Helsen um is basically uh what on a vigil, he's dropping. yeah, and he's on a vigil on on the, and then you you hear, and it's got the, got the crazy house housekeeper laying yeah. on the earth, the grave, that, yeah, yes, and and basically like helping her, 
um, give birth. Give birth. Yes. Yeah, so keep, yeah, yeah, keep yeah, coming. Yeah. I can't help you. You need to dig your way out and all yes. that. Yes. Kind of and that's my favourite bit. I think that was a, an excellent, sort of really creepy mm. sort of sort of scene. Come, wake up. No, I can't help you. You've got to be strong. What? Yes, I know it's dark, but you've got to push. Yes. Push. That's right. Push. Now, just one little effort more. You'll soon be here. Come now. Come, my precious. Come, um, my little love, there, ah, the master's waiting for you. Ah, 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 there she is. Ah, she comes, there's my little beauty. Ah, the clever one. Ah, 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 there's my clever one. Of has, but it's not buried very, very deep because when she opens the lid of the coffin, it's probably about two centimeters of um, earth on top of it. Mm. Um, yeah, but that's when you see one of the first okay. This film's called The Brides of Dracula. Dracula's not on it, and there aren't mm. any brides, brides in it either. But this is <laughs> yeah. like one of the two um, female vampires which we, we see in, in this film, yes, who, mm. who essentially um, Van Helsen has a little bit of a tussle. Um, and then she just runs away, which is yes. something which is like which happens a lot with his <laughs> yes. vampire sort of encounters in this. It's film. quite strange because it starts off as the best scene in the film, and then it just goes to be a bit of a damp squib, doesn't yes. it? Yes, and it's also the last really good scene in the film because after that, it's a bit like James says, it becomes a formulaic kind of trotting mm. around different mm-hmm. kind of locations and stuff. Mm. Um, you see oh. the bat for the first time, which yes. is too bad. Yeah. I don't think the bat's too bad. No. Um, they just com- don't move like bats. Like bats, well, no, uh, yeah, no. Th- these are big, like, bats flap really, really fast. Yes, mm. the bat's wings flutter, don't they? Yeah. In, in a very kind of strobic way, whereas this kind of glides just, like a crow or yeah. something. Um, and then you... Uh, so... The, the oh, Bernhardsen oh, goes back to the castle. Yes. And yeah, so I get point. the mother returns, so does Baron Meinster. Yes. He does that right. And Holding I put, his cape up, put to I, I wondered what the hell you were doing then, Cleves. Ro- yeah. Ross has just done an action <laughs> of the Baron, our vampire, yes. arriving on the scene. Yes. And now before I read the article that, that John uh, sent to us both, and he's brilliant, and again, go away and read it. I put, he doesn't arrive with big crystally energy. It's a bit more Larry Graham slash Graham Norton. Yeah. <laughs> I'm I'm Larry think, like, Grayson. Yeah. Yes, that's what I meant. Larry yeah, Grayson. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Larry Sh- Graham. Shut that coffee. <laughs> <laughs> the bass player from Sly and the Family Stone. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes. Um, so yes, dear listener, it's a bit more Larry Grayson slash Graham Norton yes. of, a, of an arrive. I'm it? free. A, woo, I'm here. <laughs> yes. Yeah. It's very camp. It's very... Mm. Um, it's a bit James Brown, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he you falls down. Him yeah, yeah and then down. someone helps him up and puts oh. his cape back on him. Yeah. Interesting, <laughs> he wears grey. He's a grey vampire rather yes. than black as well. He's very he? smart. And what I should also say is that Peter Cushion has got a really amazing double-breasted jacket on in this. Yes, he does. And he I've... looks the best in any film that he... I mean, I've gone on about his hair for a long time, which then I found out was a two. <laughs> which was a bit disappointing, but he's got a lovely jacket on. What, what have you got there? I, I've just written Van Helsing's coat is classy. Oh, it's, it's and really I'm, I'm, nice. Isn't it? it is lovely. Um, coat. Yeah. It's quite atypical for kind of 1960s, 1890s film. Mm. It's, it's a very, very smart kind of Savile Row mm. thing. Mm. Um, so after the um, Van Helsing is sort of, has a little bit of a tussle and the table gets flipped and the vampire runs away. He's just left to have quite a nice conversation with the mother. And this is where all the stuff where he, she talks about, like he was involved with these people. And this is kind of what they implied that he was involved with, with Dracula. And there was like Dracula had like some kind of, some, some, some kind of cult going on. Um, and then it's quite nice that he kind of, he, he just sits up with her until the morning and then stakes mm. her. 
He, and he says, "I've well." He says to her, "I have a way to to kind yes. of cure you." And she kind of does like a like a, like a beautif- beatific smile, doesn't she? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> but that, the, that the way is, I'm going to murder strange. you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's quite weird. It's very well, strange, isn't it? And the other incredible bit from dialogue that they have is she says to, she says to Van Helsing, "You'll never catch him. He's too clever." And I've just put typical deluded parent. Yeah. As yeah. a man who works in education, oh, he's too clever, is he? Well, guess Boomer what? I've, yeah, I've read his essays. And he is not too clever, and I will easily catch him. Yeah, he's only going to be in one of three locations, which we keep cycling around. So he's not going anywhere. Don't worry. I've got his bloody coffin. Yeah, come on, game over. Right. Yes. So mean, and then from there, we then learn that um, they go back to the school, back back to the girls' school. And the incredible um, revelation that the Baron has now started romancing uh, this is Danielle. Yeah. Um, he's a Marianne Danielle. He started romancing yeah. her and they're going to get married. Mm. Yeah. Uh, um, after like... This is where the film ten loses seconds. me. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, she, yeah. she knows he's a murderer. At least yeah. a murderer. Maybe yeah. not a vampire. Does she yeah. know? At this yeah. point, yeah, because Van Helsing's yeah. told her that, because, and because, he yeah, hasn't because, told her anything, has he? At this well, point, well, she's seen the mad, the mad maid kind of going, ah, ha, 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 What have you done? Yeah, what have and, you done? And the body of the mother you know. in the in the house. Yes, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> um. Yeah. Good point. Does she see the mother? I yeah, don't know. She, if she, she, she saw the, the mother, mother with the with the. I don't the bite know if she does. Yeah, the oh, bite mark, yeah. Anyway, yeah. you're going to have to check, Cleve. I'm watching But it, yeah. um, I agree that um, this is where the film loses me because it's like the uh, Hammer films often take place in this universe where like a day is made to feel like a year where people have these relationships that grow. And then when you think about it, it's like you've only met that person this morning and now you're in love with them and you're going to live with them. And modern Doctor Who often does this. It's like, you met that person 10 minutes ago in this episode and now you're going to get married. Mm. And it's a bit like this in this film. Whereas if you, what you said, Cleves, which I think would make more sense is if he just hypnotised her and said, we are now going to get married, mm. that would that would fit in much better, wouldn't it? That would fit with his character. That would make the story work. But otherwise, it's just like, why are you getting why are you marrying this guy? It just doesn't make any sense at all. And then, yeah, so then they just carry on then, don't they? Yeah. So then we have the, the two women, um, the two uh, trainee teachers, sort of like talk about how dreamy the Baron is whilst, yes. whilst making toast. And, uh, yes. Uh, and and she says that she's obviously going to leave to marry him. Mm. And I, my yeah. note is, look, as always, it's impossible to keep teachers in the profession. <laughs> no sooner is she trained up, she's off. Yeah, the same day. The same day. Same day. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but then the the, uh, the other uh, trainee teacher is sort of whispery saying, oh, I wish he would come and uh, um, whisk me away. Me. Um, but then when Marianne... She is better looking than Marianne, she is. isn't she? she is. Yeah. She, yeah. She's got a very unusual face. Yeah, and I think she was cast for her looks, mm. and she looks very good as a vampire. Yeah. Um, Spoilers. So then, um, <laughs> <laughs> so they open the window because she burns the toast, and Marianne go downstairs. Is and, that what happens? Yeah, yeah. And that's how the vampire gets in. Um, I don't remember any of that. Yeah, part. but there's a there's a nice nice little touch there because the girls sit in front of the the mirror front of the mirror. Yes, talking. that part's good, and mm. the, and the vampires obviously come in, but she can't yeah. see him through with the uh, the barons come and in, and then she turns around and screams. Yeah, and he's uh, yeah, and then becomes he's... vampirized, mm. and then we start getting a lot of Hammond organ or church organ yeah. action <laughs> in Excelsis. <laughs> it really really goes for it. Um, so this is now leading us up to our denouement. We're at mm. that point again. When I looked at how long it had been running for, I was like, this is all going to wrap up in about 10 minutes. Yeah, well, like and any oh, hammer film. You know it. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, I've just written down, uh, at one point, the head, the, head, the headmaster uses the line, troglodyte indifference, <laughs> which I thought was magnificent. It might not even be the headmaster. It might have been the, uh, the doctor. I think anyway, it's I the just, doctor, yeah. Yeah, I just, I just thought troglodyte indifference was fantastic. Turns up and disappears. Gonna... Yeah, the, the doctor. Yeah, yeah, t- turns up, disappears. Yeah. And we learn that the vampires are now h- holed up in the local windmill. Yeah. Yes, as, as, you, as they do. Yes. And so Van Helsing decides that he is going to go and obviously confront, confront them. them. 
Uh, when he gets in there, we <laughs> now then get... Yeah, come on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And then when he gets inside, first of all, before the main vampire, the, the, you know, the Baron turns up, we now see our Brides of Dracula. So it's the girl who's ris- crawled out of the grave. <laughs> yes. The girl who's just been turned. And dun, 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 the maid. It turns out that she was a vamp. She'd been That's vamped right. or maybe had been turned at some point all along. Okay. I, Who I, is it? I wasn't, I wasn't aware that she was a vampire, but yeah. Well, yeah. All right. Yeah, because because Christian gets the, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. the old get, crucifix yeah, out yeah, and she yeah. goes, Wah! Yeah, that's like, right. like leaps out the way of it. Yeah, and then falls falls down the stairs and yeah, onto yeah. A, a, an obvious crash mat. She's yes. got a very oh, I th- I thought that was quite a good death. A mm. lot of dust and stuff, and then she is she on top of like some kind of mine shaft then that disappears Something. and yeah, but she drops the crucifix and up down there. So she, yeah, that's all right. That, all that part part works quite well, doesn't it? Yeah, um, and then then the Baron turns up and you think he's going to do some kind of like vampiric sort of attack, but no, he's got a massive chain underneath his. That, um, well, before yes. he does all that, Miles. The other note was, and we saw this with the old uh, Seven Brides of Dracula. Seven, not Seven Brides of Dracula. What's the the, the, the Kung <laughs> Seven Fu Golden one. Vampires? Thank the you. Seven that one. Brides for Seven Brothers. Seven brothers of, Dracula. of Golden Vampires. Yeah. <laughs> I noticed that, that Peter Cushing never looked comfortable in an action scene, does he? Yeah. He, no. he always looks like he's really like... Oh, he, he looks uh, frenetic uh, and <laughs> kind of stiff, doesn't he? He yeah. does look stiff. Yeah, and his hair one. goes awry. <laughs> there's, some, yeah. there's some great Cushing um, choking action, which we haven't seen yeah. since the yes. Frankenstein. Yeah, well, it's, yes. it's Pertwee-esque as well, at best, yeah. isn't it? In one of our previous episodes, when which one of the Frankenstein's was it, Ross? It was uh, the the Curse of Frankenstein. Curse of Frankenstein. Yeah. We I think had as the episode image or like a fantastic yeah. bit when Frankenstein gra- uh, Frankenstein's monster grabs Peter Cushing as Frankenstein, who goes yes, ah. yes. But obviously, for the listener, that won't help. The but tongue comes out, doesn't the it? The tongue comes out, and his eyes go very, very wide. And if it was you lovely imagine, to see. Um, if you can imagine John Pertwee being strangulated by a nestine yeah. at the end of um, Spearhead, Spearhead from Space. From space. Oh, Spearhead which, from Space. Which is the only Doctor Who series to be totally shot on 16mm film. Really? Thus, thus no. being ready-made for Blu-ray. Um, it's almost exactly People like People have been that. waiting for that for such a long time. So long. How long yeah. was it? When did I last mention oh, it? I we haven't know, said man. it for a couple of hours. You'll have a spreadsheet. Well. You'll have a spreadsheet, <laughs> yeah. exactly. So, yes, um, the, uh, the Baron, the vampire, kind of strangles... Uh, Van Helsing and, and then he actually this sucks point, his blood actually I was yes. going to say there is a twist because you think oh is, he, is there some sort of rope or dope going on here is there going to be like surprise <laughs> I'm not, not unconscious no he is unconscious and he bites him yes like, whoa okay twist yeah I thought he's actually been bitten but he doesn't yeah. drain him he, no, he, he just leaves them there Tim. whilst the, the, the brides are sort of just watching. And I put down, it is very, very nice of the brides to just stand back and watch this happening. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but this is interesting because this is the kind of thing which would, being slightly on the spectrum and uh, a, a weird kid, this would have thrown me into like a, a tiz mm. of like, what are the rules about being bitten by a vampire? As we have seen, they are not consistent. Yeah. Ross, so if you've been there bitten, are, there are any. Yeah. Because I thought, well, <laughs> if you've been bitten, that's it. Um, you, you then become a vampire, or or is it a case that you need to be drained, and then they give you some of their blood? Or then I, I also remember a, a film when I was a kid. You need to be bit three times to, to be turned into. Oh, uh, what did Anne Rice say? But, but, <laughs> but apparently, on here, all you need to do is to get rid of it. Is um heat up a piece of metal and then like burn, burn your neck yeah. yeah and get rid of the um the, the scars that way but then and put holy water holy on water it. Yeah. on it yeah 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that was it uh, yeah he was then fine it just, then it just fades Cures. away and so yeah so despite the i thought oh i genuinely thought it was going to be a and now he's got to kill the my whole thing was oh okay in by killing him he'll then be like oh now i'm not a vampire yeah. but no it wasn't even that as you said he he does this weird cure to himself which mm. has never yes. been seen before or since, or since yeah. yeah but he then da- yeah but they was also saying maybe this is one of the only times you see um a a vampire in a hammer film where a male vampire so, it feeds on a on a man so and again, again yes the again, sexuality the thing sort, some yep. of the sort of the, the queer and um uh, subtext in this film. You don't be... see, so you don't see Christopher Lee bite Jonathan Harker, do you? No, I don't think you do. So that this is the first time you see a man-on-man vampire, is it? I believe so. Yeah, and one of the few mm. times. Yeah, well, exactly. Yeah, yeah. 
but again, but the, so the, then the, what happens? Well, the brides are, are watching this the whole time, watching him cure himself. It's, it's, why? Do, why aren't they attacking? Uh, I've forgotten to say the bit where the other school teacher comes back. The padlocks dropping off the coffin. Yes, mm. is is stolen from Count Magnus by M. R. James. Yes, mm. yes. Anyway, carry on. Be nice. Here. So, but while this is all happening, um, the Baron has gone away to get the uh, Marianne and bring her back to the um, mm. to, to the um, uh, windmill for no other reason than the, for no reason a grand yeah, finale, yeah. which is yeah, about yeah. it. Um, yeah, and then they have a a, a bit of a confrontation. And essentially set fire to the. He, uh, thro- he throws the holy water over Baron Meinster's face. Yes. Yeah. So there's there's quite a nice uh, makeup effect then of his burned flesh, mm-hmm. isn't there? Mm. And then he kicks over um, a brazier. The, yeah, the brazier where Peter Cushing has heated up the thing to get the thing off his neck. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then that, uh, weirdly, he is then afraid of the fire he is himself caused. Yes. And there's a lot of dubbed sound effects of him going, ah, ah, <laughs> ah, over and over again. And then Peter Cushing. They, they climb he, up to the top of the window. Does he run upstairs and then out the front of the mill? So the, basically the ending is very much um, stolen from the end of the first Universal Frankenstein. Yes. yes. Um, but then... Baron Meinster runs outside. He's got his melted face. Peter Cushing jumps on the sails of the um, windmill to make the f- shape of the cross. Yes. Mm. And, but, yeah, and ca- casts the shadow of the cross onto the vampire. Which and, then, yeah. and then that kills him, yeah. which seems a bit of an odd way to die, just from a shadow of a windmill. There's no there's no stake through the heart. There's no, no. silver bullet. There's no garlic. I put, to, I put down that he basically just gives up. <laughs> Which I like, with. Essentially, what happened was Fancy. we got to uh, one hour and 25 minutes. Yeah. And we have got to wrap this up. Yeah. So you don't see what happens to the other two brides no. of Dracula in their night dresses. No. Nope. Um, the titular and- characters of the of the film. Are, yes. Are, are, um, you never seen And them. then Peter Cushion and um, the lady who was touted as the next Brigitte Bardot have a nice cuddle and then it said, mm. does it say the end? It probably does, doesn't we, it? We yeah. just watched the, the credits go over a burning model of a, of yeah. <laughs> of a Spitfire. <laughs> no coda as usual. Yeah. No <laughs> coda, yeah. We've we've hit one hour 30 guys. Sorry. Uh, no one, you know, we are we need to clear the cinema for the next mm. one. Yeah. Well, yeah. well, we've got the, the leech woman coming up. So we need to- <laughs> and then Cliff Richard's summer holiday. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Go and buy yourself some um, jelly beans or something. Yeah, jelly babies. Yeah, so what do we think, guys? I loved the first hour. Mm. I think the the half, the, the last, or what, what other podcasts would say, the third act, mm. I, uh, let it down because it just kind of becomes a bit mechanical then. Yeah, I for me... Um... It looked amazing, mm. but I think it, the story was, was was nothing really. That I feel like it, it sets up a great story, story and there, it doesn't yeah. deliver on anything. I like, the mother, I, the mad maid, him chained up in the castle. Yeah, yeah. And then it's all just like, oh, we've released Basic him now, and then it's like, <laughs> no, it goes very quickly into hammer tropes. Then of like, I like the idea that there was. A, a, a cult of Dracula, which were yes. left behind after the uh, after the events of the first film. Also mm. interesting, um, yes, yeah. But I feel like, how on earth did they get away of putting the word Dracula on the title of this film? It, well, it's so just, tenuous. They owned the copyright. Yeah. I guess. it it demeans what they've done with the film, which is actually not a bad film, mm. just by yeah. making it look like it's a cash mm. in, doesn't mm. it? Because it's so many things mentioned Dracula at that era mm. and they've got nothing at all to do with anything to do with Dracula. They should have makes... caught, they should have kept the disciples of Dracula. As a yeah, 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 yeah. It's yeah. just, and this the way when you look at the tra- the trailer, the way they were trying to market this is like, it's in a girl's school. You're going to, and it's going to be like sexy vampires. And it's like stuff you, yeah. like, you've never seen before with like, like sexy women. And it's going to be amazing. Yeah. And it's like, this, it's nothing to do with that at all. Yeah. Um, my thought was like, maybe it, I feel like 
this could have been the first Van Helsing film. They should have mm. just called it Van Helsing, but then yeah, it, and, I, brought, and brought him into the film earlier. A Van Helsing series would have been a really good idea. I think mm. it starts really well as a gothic thriller, and it ends as a quite by numbers kind of yes. pot boiler, which th- is a shame, really. I think if it didn't look so good, it would have been mm. like Even terrible. Worse. I'd given it a two mainly for yeah. what, what it looks like. Yeah. How about you, James? What have you got in it? Same, same. I agree with uh, John's assessment. Starts off as like a quite interesting gothic um, horror story. It becomes very, very formulaic. However, um, I did really, really enjoy the the aforementioned article, and that made me kind of gave me a, a new yes. perspective on it. Mm. And also, I love finding out that Van Helsing is a philosophy graduate. Yeah. So that's <laughs> that's two out of five for me too. Yeah, John, what are you going to give it? For the context of the article, in a kind of socio historical. Thing. it's kind of a three or a four for the actual film it's like a one or a two isn't it which is a shame because the first hour is great but then it's just like mm. which is really disappointing when and it does make me think how does something as awful as life force <laughs> get a five out of yeah, no, no be be consistently more entertaining than a film which is obviously a better film but is less entertaining. It's, mm-hmm. it's quite weird. What you find entertaining and what touches one part of your brain compared yeah. to something else is, is, is quite an interesting thing. And I don't think anyone knows how to put their finger on what the difference is. No. Really. I would say um, universally on, cause I put out on, on, yeah. on Twitter, what do you think of it? Everyone mm. loves it. The people are putting it as either wow. their favorite or in their top three wow. Dr- Dracula films. That's okay. mental. Yeah. So um, considering Dracula was not even in it. <laughs> Really? Yeah, yeah. So, um, mm. that's interesting. But maybe they're just not as uh, intelligent as us. <laughs> <laughs> the views of John do not reflect the, <laughs> the views of uh, the General Witch Finders podcast. But I think it, that was that explains why it, it won the poll because we should yes. we should have mentioned that um, every ten episodes we do tend to open this up to um, the li- our listeners, and this was the one that won barely won the poll. Mm. Um, it was between this and the one with Cleggan, which I really wish. <laughs> We, we well, I can do Taste the Taste the Blood of Dracula is a very, very different film, and it would be interesting to review it to to look at the difference in this because there's only like eight or nine years between the two films, mm. and it is literally an ocean of difference because the scenes in a brothel, there's prostitutes, snakes. I seem the, to remember. There's all sorts yeah. of mad shit. Yeah. There's Ralph Bates from TV's yes. Dear John. Yeah. Dear John, <laughs> do, 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 do. dear John, since you've been gone, what's all like by that? the time <laughs> you will have read this, I'll be I'll gone. Be gone. <laughs> with, with Vince, remember Vince? Yes, and he wasn't no, really I don't cool remember at all. Well, but he, was, he was a character, yeah. Oh, I remember God. being but, shocked when Ralph Bates died. <laughs> he died very young, didn't he? he did, like 1994 yes. or something. But, um, it's a very different film, and there's only nine years between those films. Whereas now, I don't think you have nine years between films. Now you don't have a quantum leap in terms of feel and content, do you yeah. anymore? A lot of stuff um, changing. Um, like, like you know, one one Tom Cruise Mission Impossible film is now much the same as oh, another. I don't know, man. Yeah. If you've watched Mission Impossible two like recently, <laughs> it's insane. <laughs> uh, We've got long hair and doing lots of like like. Donuts John Woo. Like motorbike and yeah, stuff. Yeah. But the that's one that's like that. Mission yeah. Impossible Ghost Nation or whatever yeah, yeah. the fuck it's called, that's yeah. on every night on film four now, <laughs> looks ex- almost exactly the same to like the one yeah. that was in the cinema like last week. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it's just him looking short and muscular, isn't it? And jumping off things on a motorbike. In slow motion, yeah. Yeah, whereas this is like the, the, the beginning of the 60s and the end of the 60s was just like, the most insane explosion that you can mm. really come to think about really culturally. Mm. Uh, and the, and the, and the hammer films really reflect that because they just, they chucked it all in with the kitchen sink. Uh, and by you, by the time you get to something in the early seventies, like the vampire lovers, you just got it all on mm. display. And you're just <laughs> like, this is mad. Within 13 years, they've gone from like very kind of, um, uh, not closeted, but kind of like very coquettish mm. female characters to just vampires with their tits out at literally every opportunity, and brought back to brought back brought back to life out of a coffin just because a bit of blood is sprayed on. Them. Yeah, yeah. Did you think that 
I was watching this, it made me think of the um, the Twins of Evil. There was there was certain well, aspects yeah. of this which yeah, were yeah, yeah, very yeah. Twins That's of Evil esque. Yeah, but look, how different is this film to Twins of Evil? Like Twins of Evil is probably one of the best later hammers because it's got quite good production values, but there's still way too much just pointless gratuitous nudity and like loads of like carry on style Stroking like, of candles. Yeah, and the guy that's like the hero is just like heavy panting any time like a woman walks in the room and stuff. And it's like, this film is more realistic, isn't it? Um, because it's just like, it's more of a kind of, it, it doesn't have to throw everything into the mix to kind of keep the viewer's attention. I think I think the main thing is that, that this film isn't necessarily competing with television Mm-hmm. like the later films were com- competing mm. with. People wanted to stay in and they wanted to watch Bob Monkhouse on the Golden Shot mm. uh, or Z Cars. They weren't necessarily interested in horror films. At that I, th- I think someone on Twitter, um, at Harry Git, um, All right. Yeah, he described it quite well. He said, it's the best Hammer films invoke childhood nightmares, and this certainly does. Mm. The sets and the lighting are beautiful, and it's like walking into a Grimm's fairy tale. I, I, I can't. I agree. Yeah, with that. yeah. I totally yeah. agree. But the last half hour is is quite just formulaic yeah. and by yeah. number, absolutely by numbers. They've got to, yeah. They've got to come up with a better way to kill the vampires at the end. That's, I think that's, that's. I think that that bus has passed Cleves because this film was made like <laughs> sixty odd years ago or something. How? When was this made? Oh, sixty. How old does that make it? Sixty three years old. Mm. This film is older than Johnny Marr. <laughs> Great yardsticks to use. Yeah. Have we any of us got anything horrific to um, talk about this week? Yes, I have, Ross. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> what have you got there, John? Uh, well, Ross, um, as we mentioned earlier, the news is that Mark Gatiss, TV's Mark Gatiss and of the League of Gentlemen has announced that the new um, ghost story for Christmas is going to be the Conan Doyle story, (gasps) which is lot number 249. Cool. Which is a mummy story. Ah, nice. um, uh, Which was uh, written by Conan Doyle in the 1890s or 1880s, I think. So it's a bit of a change. It's the first one, I think, that Mark Gatiss has done, which isn't an M.R. James one, which is a slight disappointment for me, but it is a very good story. And I think it's the first time that a mummy uh, in the story, I think it's the first time that the mummy was seen as the kind of evil protagonist Mm. in a story rather than just a kind of thing from Egyptian history. So it's quite a good kind of historical story. I've read the story and it's really good. So I'm looking forward to it. It's quite a good cast. Uh, that I can't remember off the top of my head. I think it's got Kit Harrington out of it, out of her yes. Game of Thrones. Game of Thrones. Yeah. Who my friend Jane used to go out with, I think. Really? Oh, yeah, I think so. Um, I like him. Yeah, he's he's a good actor. So, yeah, I'm really looking forward okay, to it. Okay, so let's just check. So, he, previous ghost stories mean the, the track tape mid off. Yeah, Emma James? Emma James. The yeah, Dead yeah. Room. Well, The Dead Room, I think, was Mark wrote it himself. Mm-hmm. Yes. Oh, fucking adverts. Uh, um, <laughs> don't remember that one <laughs> leave that in please <laughs> it just popped up do you want to buy the radio times no Martin's <laughs> Close yeah oh, that one's James. brilliant yeah that's, that's great yeah, yeah, I with love um, Judge Jeffries yeah. yes yeah, uh, um, The Mesotint yeah Mesotint and, yeah. and Count Magnus those are yes. the ones he's done so far yeah 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 so there's a few. I've got a list of the ones that I would want to do, and the one that I would want to do, I think it's called the case of an appearance and a disappearance, which is a dream, which is mainly a dream sequence about a Punch and Judy show, which is the most cinematic short story you've ever read mm. that is written before cinema was invented. Mm. It's quite mental, and I would really like to do that one. But um, yeah, so I'm looking forward to it. I think it'd be really good. For- it, I mean, it's going to be one of the only things probably worth watching over Christmas, won't oh, it? Yeah. The other things will be the Strictly Christmas special. <laughs> um, Doctor Who Christmas special? Doctor, is, are they 
doing a Christmas special. Yeah, it's, they've um, uh, Disney Plus accidentally leaked. Uh, it's going to be on Christmas Day, and it's oh. and it's, and it's called sort of like the house on. Oh my god, I get the name. One second. Uh, so that will be the new. That's not tenant. That's no, that's the new a shooty. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Interesting, because they're sh- still shooting around Cardiff. It's, that's the second series. Okay. Yeah. Um. Uh. The list, some listeners will be interested to know that I was recently in a room with Russell T. Davis. Were you? Took his photo, but I didn't speak to him. <laughs> I just thought he should come and speak to me. Really? Yeah. Yeah. By now, it's gonna be called the. It's gonna be called the Church on Ruby Road. Oh. Uh. Is the new companion's called Ruby? Yes. Uh, Interesting. Okay. Yeah. Cool. There James, what have you got okay. for us? My one is I got with when I got my PlayStation 5. <laughs> um, when I got, so when I upgraded to a PlayStation 5, they said, Oh, thank you for doing this. Here, have six months of Apple Plus. So oh, okay. I've got, I've, so I've had Apple for the last few, uh, few months. Uh, there's Severance, which is brilliant, and I highly recommend any, everyone watch Severance. It's a really great series. But then the main thing, uh, and for interest for our listener, uh, would be they have done the <laughs> um, the, en- the Enfield Poltergeist. Oh, now, of okay. course, the Enfield Poltergeist is a great touchstone for this This podcast. is what you two we- keep talking about, the fucking Lego bro. Lego. <laughs> <laughs> yes! Right. So what they've done, it's really good because back in the 70s, the Enfield Poltergeist Gast, Gast was really heavily recorded. Yes. By, you know, they recorded so much of it. So what they've got is they've got all the original tapes and they've they've had people act over the tapes. Oh, wow. As it were. And it's odd, but it's really good. It's oh, very, really, really convincing. And I said, if you're interested in this sort of thing in any way, shape or form, it's mm-hmm. good because it's, they don't rush it and they don't rush through it. And they, uh, at the moment, of course, that Danny Robbins, the uncanny thing is out. And I find that this, the Enfield Poltergeist series finds a nice balance between saying at the start, obviously the, there is no ghost, but at the same time as well, presenting it as that's creepy and that's weird mm-hmm. and that's odd. But, and then as you get through the episodes, it kind of, they kind of expand out as to, well, what was actually going on here? Mm-hmm. And that's really interesting too. Just saying mm-hmm. kind of like the, 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 the family dynamics that were at play there, the mm-hmm. ages of the people involved. And then it all starts to kind of like make a little more sense. But the fact that, you know, people like Morris Gross, who uh, was the main guy and the amazingly named Guy Playfair, mm-hmm. uh, like, you know, how much they bought into it. Yeah, because, and, bought it, uh, because um, Morris Gross's daughter died. That's right. That's, and, yeah. that's right. But I never realized that he got his son to turn up, who's now a lawyer, who was a lawyer. His son, who was a mad, ske- like really skeptical, going, oh, this is all balls. And he's like, no, come and talk to her. Mm. And they speak to him, and he's like, "It was terrifying. It mm. was." And then I was like, "Jesus Christ, I'm being spoken to by a ghost." And mm. then, of course, they they actually speak to all the the parties involved. Oh, really? Today, is Helen. Is her name Helen? Okay. No. What's the name? The but anyway, she, yeah, but she's in it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Mm, wow. So, yeah. as a real re- person, not someone playing her now. N- no, no, no. They actually speak to the re- the real her. Wow. Okay, that's interesting. At the end, and the other sister as well, and it's they- really, really good. They touched on it in a bit with the recent Uncanny TV mm. series, didn't mm. they? Which I thought was very interesting. Did he? Did either of you, both of you, watch the Uncanny TV series? I've seen two of them. Uh, mm, okay. People keep telling me to watch it, so I'm being really quite like stubborn about not watching it. So <laughs> I, should I? Yes, it's okay. really good. All right, I'm okay. I think it survives the move to TV really well. Mm-hmm. I think two episodes of the three episodes are really strong. Mm-hmm. I can't remember the order though. One of them isn't so strong, and it might mm. be the one with the Enfield Poltergeist in it. Mm. Yeah. yeah, there's a there's a, a documentary about Enfield Poltergeist on Paramount Plus, um, and they go to the guy who is uh, what's it the sick this what do they call it that the 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 group. The, the Par- Society for Psychical Re- Research. It, yeah. mm. So the guy who um, who has their archives, he's essentially got these two big chalets in his back garden <laughs> with like all of the. So they they got he's got the box of all the tapes yeah. from the yeah, 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 yeah. thing. He's got the box of like all the bits of Lego that got thrown around mm. and all that kind of yes. stuff. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah. like 
there's just boxes and boxes of this stuff. And you feel like, I would just love to go and have a, a route through all of these mm. things. Mm. Again, all bollocks, but, uh, you know, listen to some of those, um, wow, well, oh, you know, D60s, are they called D60s with the, um, the, when you had like a 60 minute tape, a D90 and a D60. The miniature ones. Yeah. yeah. On a dictaphone. Yeah, yeah. I had some of them. What we should review on this podcast is, um, when Nick and Katrina from Paranormal Lockdown UK went to investigate the Black Monk yeah. in my in birth Pontefract. town of Pontefract. Oh, I'm up for it. Because yeah. that's pretty wild. And I think it's until mainly recently, puddles, isn't it? I think. <laughs> I mean, that was think the, the main, the main of, the, of that haunting. Puddles people. of piss. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think until recently, and I'm not sure if you still can, you could stay in the house. Someone had bought the house. So people could go and stay in the house where the black monk had been seen. But also uh, on uh, on that bombshell, we should also go and visit the place in Gloucester where Zach Bagans has been. Yes, going, the old Ram Inn. We've got. I to go keep there, thinking about that all yeah. the time. Yeah, 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 yeah. So next time. Christmas. It's Christmas. And so we'll be doing the BBC Ghost Story. It's Christmas! Christmas. <laughs> um, next time will be the BBC Ghost Stories for Christmas. We'll be doing yes. the Stools of Barchester oh. and the Treasure of Abbot Thomas. Oh. So the best thing about the first one is Robert Hardy's clip clop shoes. <laughs> I watch it. That's a really bad name. I rewatch <laughs> it just to enjoy how clip cloppy his shoes are. Yeah. Because well, he's are. walking around the cloisters of, I think it's Norwich Cathedral they use, and his shoes are insanely clip cloppy. Fuck knows what they were made of, like <laughs> aluminium. <laughs> um, Is he like Roy Castle? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're like tap shoes. <laughs> and it's brilliant, I love it. And it's like he's being followed at one point by someone else with clip cloppy shoes on, and you're like, I just love how clip cloppy these shoes are. Because no one has clip cloppy shoes anymore, no. do they? they? Everyone's just got trainers now. So if we see that episode and it's four hours long, it's because I've looped three hours of clip cloppy shoes at the yeah. end of the episode. <laughs> if, and dear listener, if that doesn't, if that doesn't serve as a, an amuse-bouche <laughs> for what's coming next, I don't, I don't know what does. But thank you as always for listening. Yes. And yes. everyone stay well. And until next time, yeah. we'll see you we'll see you then. yeah happy day love light and peace you have been listening to the general witch finders <laughs>13 mr james <laughs> the one the one window disappears late at night That'd be uh, how's exciting. the um how's the uh, service station getting on james uh, that's all right uh, <laughs> <laughs> amazing a uh, shell that's what busy, you, that's if john had like a, a high definition projection system it would be of, of a garage I, that's i'd love that just <laughs> watching a garage all night that would be amazing wouldn't it people going Currently, in there's only one car and it's it's not at the, at the pumps oh, so very very weird. quiet at the moment what well, that's where i go and get have like a, a late night window james for places like that where people go and buy stuff when they've got the munchies they do but this one doesn't really utilize it they shut it down at 11 uh, uh, so I when i was younger my one of my uncles used to work in a garage overnight and sometimes i got to go and like hang out hang out in there with him yeah. like, and like yeah. you know restock the shelves and sometimes when he was like having a nap on the um I'd set up on the counter in my pajamas and like take the money off the people. Wow! That's so you, Cleves. you never told me that. Yeah. Did you have a straw hat on as well, Cleves? Uh, no, but it's the same one. It was his straw hat I was wearing in the, the picture you may have seen <laughs> with the cravat and the um and the waistcoat. Oh, oh lord! Um, <laughs> right, right, let's get into it.
Let's right. start this. Oh, um... Also, and before we get this going, Ross, I've got to say at some point, um, our, my friend Joe, who you met, I said to her, oh, you got to listen to the Life Force one. We give you a shout out. And then you cut it out. Did I? <laughs> 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 yeah, oh, because, because that's all right. Because of the way you did the whole, hang on, have we started yet? Have we started yet? And mm. the way you've edited, which yeah. is good. Yeah. But you obviously cut it out in the midst oh, of all that. So I said to her, I'm so sorry. I'll try my hardest yeah. to say thank you on the next one. So we'll probably do that at the end or something. Okay, but yeah, yeah. okay right. <laughs> okay, to, to, to the script. To the script. <clears throat> right. Okay. Hang on. Let's get that right. Ross, I can just hear like a bit of whistling. Yeah, in my I can headphones. hear it too. Yeah. It's it's a car outside with oh. um a very loose um alternator belt by the sound Ooh. of it. Yeah, okay. it's gone. That was, that do that, that was, again. That was the sound I used to when my dad used to get up early to go to work. You, yeah, you could, you could hear that noise as his car was warming up on the drive yeah. and he was pouring. Well, the water. he needed to. Yeah, he needed to tighten his fan belt, didn't he? Yeah. But it was what a, car was it, Cleves? It was a. It was a. It was a larder, like a. <laughs> Wow. Yeah. A re- a really? Yeah. It was like a beige larder. A beige larder. I'd love a larder now. Yeah. James, carry on. We, uh, I don't oh, sorry, want the guy to call us mor- moronic. And, uh, no, no, it's fine. <laughs> I think I, I like the sound of the fan belt. Go on, James. Excellent. Right. Okay. 